Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be well remotely at MoneroCon. Uh, I'm sorry to say that Yatima and I couldn't make it this year for logistical reasons, uh, but I hope that many of the faces that I am presenting to today are similar to last year, and I hope that uh, the crowd is bigger and that there are new faces among you as well. So just to really briefly talk about who I am and what I'll be talking about today, my name is Kayesh. I am co-founder of the currently deprecated Monero Venture Capital Fund Hacking Capital and formerly a research analyst at Adrianople Group and Pronomos Capital uh, with some previous uh, experience with uh, free market uh, ideas advocacy in the Central European space at the Libertas Institute in Slovenia. And I've been involved in the crypto space on and off for the better part of half a decade now. Uh, originally very much uh, in the Bitcoin space and uh, for the last couple of years more with Monero to the point where we were attempting to create a Monero focused venture capital fund to overcome ESG and financial censorship. And uh, since hostile legislation that I will talk about later in this presentation, we've now moved to other services. I also wanted to say that I understand that a lot of the topics that I want to discuss today uh, have been to some degree already covered by the previous presenter uh, whose presentation I at least in part caught. So I will do my best not to uh, be too redundant in terms of what I will be presenting to you today. Uh, so just to jump into some terms that will become relevant further in this. I wanted to explain what ESG is. Usually I would ask for a show of hands. I understand this is difficult now. Uh, so to briefly present uh, as, as to whether you know what ESG stands for, as to briefly present, ESG is a movement in the business space that advocates for environmental, social and governance uh, criteria set on a company investments that uh, would basically determine whether that company is acting socially responsibly and whether it is reacting to government legislation or environmental risks in a way that uh, would optimize its business. It's important to understand that it's not a risk assessment tool in itself, just a, ver uh, just a very nebulous and often contradictory set of principles like we see with a lot of these socially responsible uh, investment principles. Uh, it's usually done through negative or exclusionary screenings. What this means is that traditional legacy financial institutions such as hedge funds, even many venture capital funds and banks will refuse service and specifically investment to uh, entire industries that do not comply with uh, with these uh, uh, standards. Usually these standards are taken directly from certain publications like Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations and other globalist institutions and are not based on any economic rationale, just rather sort of a political agenda. On the left side of the screen here, I hope that it's legible to you over in Prague, is uh, a common set of exclusions in ESG. And these include, importantly, entirely legal industries. Uh, these are alcohol and tobacco, cannabis, psychedelics, uh, sex work, gambling, medical tourism, the gig economy, uh, petroleum, you know, the, the usual sort of uh, uh, things that we consider dirty industry and vice industry. And it's important to note that uh, while a lot of businesses will claim to be engaging in ESG and financial censorship by proxy uh, for entirely private and voluntary socially responsible reasons, this is in practice not the case. Uh, first of all, we cannot really call the commercial banks and the central bank money issue fractional banking system an entirely private entity when the issue of money and a monopoly on currency is held by essentially government institutions. And when there are implicit regulatory threats uh, against the companies involved, that distorts the market to the point where it can no longer be called a private and voluntary decision. If you are afraid of the government clamping down on, uh, for instance, a gun manufacturer after a school shooting or holding them responsible in a dubious legal way for the for the results of it, uh, then the decision not to do business with them is less a private and voluntary decision, but uh, a by proxy result of government uh, regulation and and um, and uh, clampdown. Uh, it's also important to note that very often this comes from an ideological adherence by top level management and not a responsibility to corporate shareholders. Uh, and lastly, it's also important to note that ESG is primarily present for now in the investment space, not in the 
uh, transactional space. So even though I will go quite extensively into how people are being fin people, countries and institutions are being financially deplatformed, it's also very important to note that most of uh, these exclusionary screenings are done in the investment space. And it is very easy to note that a lot of mod the modern day economy is far more in in reliant on investment than on profit, in part because of the grossly expansionist policies that we see in monetary policy, especially since uh, COVID in 2020. So all of these together create, I would call, an avenue of control for the powers that be using the monetary system to adversely affect certain industries. And of course, it's important to note that there are also laws and regulations that require companies to adhere to ESG policies in um, in making investments, pre predominantly in Europe, as is usually the case with these so-called uh, progressive agendas. Uh, it's very important to note that it distorts the markets in, in, in a very negative way. Uh, as it stands, uh, most money in the venture capital space, which is primarily responsible for novel businesses, is coming from the European Investment Fund in Europe it's, itself. Uh, about they're, a, they're an LP in about 40 to 60 percent of uh, venture capital uh, funds in Europe with pre pre pretty large tickets. And even where they are not actively involved, the proliferation of ESG from these government institutions as LPs uh, sort of goes into pri fully privately funded institutions as well as when they seek funding in future rounds, they understand that the amount of money available to them by excluding everybody else who's already uh, received European investment fund money will be much, much lower. So as a result, uh, this sort of chokehold that the European investment fund has on venture capital uh, really restricts the growth of the undesirable industries uh, from a European perspective. Uh, in Europe, furthermore, so because uh, the European pay-as-you-go pension scheme already deprives uh, the venture capital space of a traditionally very large source of funding, uh, which would be private pension funds. Uh, Europe, most of Europe, European Union's countries operate a pay-as-you-go pension scheme that, by design, crowds out a lot of private pension savings and, as a result, uh, money going into private equity. Uh, this has all been very, very technical, but I wanted to really explain the problems with ESG before I get into the financial censorship element of this presentation. Um, it benefits established firms by reducing money available to startups that could challenge them. As a result, Europe is very uncompetitive when it comes to um, uh, the startup scene. Uh, it reduces competitive pressures, again, by reducing funding available to novel uh, firms or firms looking for rapid growth. Um, it in generally suffocates innovation, and it's one of the many, many tools that's used by governments to uh, restrict the growth of industries that they do not like. Uh, I'm, as I will talk about later, uh, this also will relate to uh, cryptocurrency and especially Monero. And to go back to quotes regarding uh, the ESG system by uh, the two founders of PayPal, whom I'm sure uh, had certain motives similar to what Monero does today before PayPal became just another uh, tool of the financial system as it is today. Uh, to quote Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, uh, it is essentially a weaponized tool uh, that is present in the private business space, but is entirely top down, uh, indirectly pushed by the powers that be in order to restrict funding to certain industries or certain individuals. Financial censorship, while it can result from ESG negative exclusions, however, is something completely different. Uh, it refers to financial institutions, payment intermediaries, and other um, institutions shutting down accounts of undesirable companies or individuals and inhibiting transactions between them. Uh, it can be mandated by governments or it can be engaged by private institutions, basically exercising their freedom of association for one reason or another. Uh, there's multiple examples of these. All of these are quite old, as this is a presentation I gave almost a year ago, but it's important uh, to note that none of the most of the ones here were not mandated by any government. They were simply done as a result of uh, sort of policies that attempted to mitigate the risk of government uh, intervention into companies themselves. Uh, some of them, of course, were um, mandated by uh, governments because of certain events. I believe the previous speaker mentioned the Canadian trucker freedom convoy problem. 
So yeah, uh, and you might be thinking, well, this only affects people on the one or other side of the political spectrum. At the end of the day, the core of the problem comes not from the fact that uh, it only affects one group of people that you may or may not agree with. It's the fact that there is a growing amount of control that's uh, becoming available as to financial transactions as they digitize and become centralized and reliant on certain intermediaries and certain systems like SWIFT uh, that gives whoever is in power and we never have someone we always agree with in power, uh, the ability to very quickly financially deplatform and destroy the businesses of many of the people involved. And to that end, I wanted to talk about Operation Choke Point, which was an Obama era DOJ program that basically decided to use the very considerable power of the FDIC to strong arm, not through legislative action, but through essentially coercion through informal and unwritten suggestions, uh, you know, haha, make him an offer he can't refuse, uh, to deplatform entire industries and entire companies from the um, traditional financial system, debank them, and give them no access to, to um, the traditional financial system. And if you look at a lot of the industries involved, uh, you'll see that essentially they align very closely with the traditional targets of ESG. And that sort of goes back to the main problem I described earlier. If Is ESG really a voluntary and a freedom of association based uh, decision if it is entirely in response to what is essentially a covert government program to deplatform entire industries from the financial system? And we're also seeing Operation Choke Point 2.0 emerging in recent years, uh, specifically the last two years, headed by the SEC to deny banking and traditional financial services to crypto companies. Sadly, we do not live in a crypto circular economy and you still need to buy your crypto somewhere. You still need to liquidate it when you want to pay rent for the most part. And the harder these bridges are controlled, uh, the easier it is for them to then attempt to enforce uh, a ban on privacy coins as we're effectively seeing right now in Europe with MICA uh, or other restrictions. So. You've, we've seen a lot of news come out lately, mostly targeting large centralized exchanges in regard to the uh, deplat financial deplatforming of these institutions. In fact, in my offshoring work, I often find that I have a lot of uh, clients specifically from the industries targeted by the first operation choke point uh, who adopted crypto and are then having trouble doing business with uh, crypto exchanges because of their access to the financial system. So as I discussed before, financial censorship, even by done with by private institutions exercising freedom of association, is often in response to uh, initiatives like Operation Choke Point that essentially sought to deplatform entire industries and reducing their own financial risk by simply not being involved, while a valid business move is still simply in response to a very dangerous government initiative. So we should be very, very wary when, uh, when describing these acts as uh, acts of um, private association. Now, I wanted, usually at this part of the presentation, when I give it elsewhere, I would explain what Monero is. I understand that in the room today, I probably don't have to do that. I do want to talk about why it's important that we talk about using Monero to avoid financial censorship and ESG-based financial exclusions rather than Bitcoin. And again, this is taken from Mastering Monero. Uh, if you're there, uh, I know some of the authors uh, or the people involved with Mastering Monero were there yesterday, so sorry for stealing your art right there. Um, there's a few examples I like to give in terms of why widespread adoption of Bitcoin could still open up the world to perhaps even more financial censorship. Uh, it's relatively straightforward, especially if you're not using Lightning transactions, which already have a problem of being extremely centralized in terms of the nodes. Uh, to reveal the total balance you're holding in your wallet. And usually here again, I would ask for a show of hands, uh, how many of you would feel comfortable walking around El Salvador with 50 Bitcoins in your wallet and paying for ice cream? I imagine that wouldn't really be the case in a, in a country that still suffers from a very high crime rate. Uh, likewise, it's you know fairly easy if you can dox someone's uh, crypto addresses on Bitcoin, see where they were paying and with enough chain analysis, it wouldn't, for instance, be difficult to create a registrar of sex workers and see if there's been any direct transactions there, infer someone's preferences or, uh, you know, based on just simple chain analysis, see, oh, this is the political party they've been donating to, oh, you know, uh, this transaction to this other person who's also been uh, doxed, was not reported to the tax authorities, yada, yada, yada. 
uh, you, you very clearly um, create even more problems per, per, per se um, with uh, create using Bitcoin as the medium of transactions between people uh, than you do with uh, using Monero or even with using the traditional financial system. It is, in fact, a greater risk of privacy to use the transparent ledger in Bitcoin. Uh, and then because and it, it's also important to note uh, that the blockchain is forever. So even if uh, even if you are currently perhaps not worried about uh, your transactions to sex workers or your donations to religious or political organizations uh, being a politically contentious problem, uh, once the data is out there, it's very easy for someone in the future where a unfriendly political party comes into power to analyze your past transactions if they happen to know your address and anyone else's and then make inferences based off of that. So the general problems of the transparent blockchain, and of course, when I'm talking about bad actors, it's also very important to note, I'm not only talking about the government. There are also private actors that can use this sort of data to engage in blackmail and all other sorts of unsavory activities. None of this uh, happens with Monero. Uh, Monero's um, opaque blockchain uh, very much helps uh, prevent these sorts of uh, risks going forward. And it's why it's important to take even entirely legal, legal and legitimate transactions that are potentially uh, a contentious issue further down the line and understand the value of, of privacy going forward. And it's also important to note that with both instances of cryptocurrency, there is no way to censor a wallet address. We, we saw this happen with... Uh, with the trucker protest in Canada, I'm sure you're all familiar with the story, where several cryptocurrency wallet addresses or several, you know, uh, Bitcoin, spendable Bitcoins were essentially blacklisted from centralized exchanges, making it very difficult to use them uh, and diminishing their value, so to say. In fact, I believe it's not in this presentation, but when I was looking through uh, some darknet marketplaces the other day, I actually managed to find a website that sells freshly minted Bitcoins for Monero. Uh, so, uh, obviously, we cannot claim Bitcoin is fungible in a situation where we are seeing completely different price points for different Bitcoins based on their history. Um, again, you already know there can be no KYC, no pl deplatforming in Monero transactions that are peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and it's important to note that as we stand right now, as I said before, we do not live in a crypto circular economy. So, all instances of financial censorship are fundamentally still effective because most of us don't get paid in crypto. Most of us don't spend exclusively in crypto. And in order to solve this problem in the short term, we need crypto adoption, like it or not, with centralized institutions. We still need ways to purchase uh, Bitcoin or Monero with fiat or they shift Bitcoin to Monero or whatever. And we still need ways to then spend that Monero or, or pay people in Monero. And the one thing I would encourage you all to do is encourage people to use Monero not as an investment tool, but as a medium of exchange, not just for transactions that could be politically contentious. Although I do believe those are by far the best uh, candidates for adoption. I believe that if you look at the industries that were excluded by Operation Choke Point on this slide, I believe those are the most uh, open to adoption of anonymous cryptocurrencies, specifically because they understand the risk of financial censorship. So if you have a friend who's uh, a tobacconist or uh, a sex worker or in any other way involved in any of these industries. I, I urge you to step up with them and encourage them to use Monero, uh, mostly for receiving payments, uh, not necessarily, even if they're not having trouble with the financial uh, system as is, as essentially a lifeboat that they can rely on once, and I don't say if, I say once the uh, traditional financial system cuts them off. But to turn back uh, here, it's important to note that narrow adoption should also be encouraged greatly in more traditional uh, institutions. Florists, there is in fact a florist in my town that takes Bitcoin cash. I know it's not great, but it's a start. Um, and other industries, because it essentially makes it life easier for financially deplatformed institutions and people, uh, even when they cannot engage with the traditional financial system. If there are avenues for ways to, for them to spend their crypto to continue with their business, uh, we're essentially closing the loop and uh, helping them survive. And it's important to note again, this is something you already know uh, a successful cryptocurrency is defined not by its price and market cap, although those can be an indicator of the true uh, def definition of success for a cryptocurrency, which is the transaction number and volume. Uh, the more transactions we see, especially for real life goods or digital services, 
uh, the more successful Monero is as a currency, in my view. And ultimately, it's not about ultimately selling your Monero for millions, it's the fact that you won't have to. Uh, that's an old meme from the crypto space, I'm sure many of you know it. And to quote F.A. Hayek uh, in relation to what needs to be done, it's not that I, it, there is no reforming, as the previous speaker said, there is no reforming the existing fiat fractional reserve financial system. Uh, we can simply create an alternative one that can enable the underdogs of society to operate undisturbed. And it's in, it, with the current situation, uh, there is opportunity uh, for Monero to do this. And uh, again, in, investment into ESG excluded industries is again, a, a very good example of that. This is what we were trying to do with tacking capital before uh, the current mess started. Uh, it basically makes, uh, as you know, it impossible to trace the relevant transactions and helps uh, protect the investors as well. Now, at this point, I would usually stop the presentation, uh, but I also wanted to say that as I talked about in the presentation before, there's currently a lot of problems with MICA and the SEC crackdown in the United States as part of Operation Choke Point 2.0. Uh, this is all true. And it's something that has uh, caused me to pivot from my previous attempt at creating a Monero adoption venture capital fund uh, to uh, mostly offshoring consulting. Uh, there are a lot of jurisdictions which allow, especially digital first uh, businesses to operate in relative calm, doing business in cryptocurrencies offshore. And my current business is now helping companies that are coming under regulatory fire in the European Union and the United States uh, move their business to so-called lifeboat jurisdictions, mostly in the Caribbean. And if any of you would be interested in that, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, that's it. I hope this was not too disjointed and incoherent. I did try to keep it in the time slot I was given. So uh, thank you all for your attention. And I'm, if you have any questions for me, I'm guessing we're gonna do the same thing as the previous speaker. So 